Okay, howdy everyone, and uh, welcome to today's session with uh, Gene Becker. Um, Gene, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I'm going to give you a quick introduction, and then we're going to play a video to set up Gene's comments. And when Jean is uh, done with her comments, uh, I'll, I'll moderate questions to her. And so if anybody has a question that comes up either now or during the video or during Jean's comments, please just chat it to me on a private chat, uh, and I'll get those to Jean uh, and serve as kind of the quasi-moderator uh, for her presentation. We appreciate you taking the time to join us, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate Jean Becker taking her time to, be, to do this uh, event with us. I think all of you know that Gene has been the chief of staff for, uh, was, was the chief of staff for President Bush from 1994 until his death. She ran everything in his Houston office uh, and in Kennebunkport, Maine. So she was pretty much uh, back and forth across the country with President and Mrs. Bush for all those years. She also served uh, for, as the deputy press secretary for Mrs. Bush back in 1989 to 1992. And she's got some book experience with the family as well because she helped Mrs. Bush um, actually research uh, write and then edit two books uh, that she put out and also as a former journalist did some pretty interesting research and editing for President Bush's book All the Best George Bush My Life and Letters and Writing which was a particularly uh, um, I think significant event uh, in President Bush's life and putting that book out as he told me once uh, because he was so committed to the idea of writing letters and communicating with people and Gene was such a big part of his effort to do that for so many years. Gene, it is an honor to have you here with us today. The best part is, despite all the rest of that stuff, you're just a great friend of the Bush School. You're a great American, and you are part of the Bush family and remain part of their family today. So thank you for joining us and uh, talking to us a little bit about uh, some people I know you love. And we're going to start by showing a quick video that Gene would like to kick off her comments. So let me share that with you right now. Uh, Lisa Brown, would you send me a chat when this thing starts to make sure that the volume's good and that you're seeing it? One night, I absolutely couldn't sleep and found myself thinking about what I've learned in life, sometimes the hard way. Try to find the good in people and not the bad. Isn't it better to make a friend than an enemy? Do not buy what you cannot afford. Don't try to live up to your neighbors and be sure you pay people back. Value your friends and remember that loyalty is a two-way street. Love your children. Don't worry that your children never listen to you. Worry that they're always watching you. Those human connections with spouses, with children, with friends are the most important investment you will ever make. You really shouldn't take yourself or life too seriously. Someone once said there are two kinds of people in the world. There are those that wake up in the morning and say, good morning, Lord. And there are others who wake up and say, good Lord, it's morning. Make sure you're the former and not the latter. None of us are the same. None of us are perfect. But it's our cracks and flaws that make our lives together so very interesting. Fathers and mothers, if you have children, they must come first. You must read to your children, and you must hug your children, and you must love your children. Your success as a family, our success as a society, depends not on what happens in the White House, but on what happens inside your house. Somewhere out in this audience may even be someone who will one day follow in my footsteps and preside over the White House as the president's spouse. I wish him well. I still believe that if more people could read, write, and comprehend, we could solve so many of our problems. The parents we've met are determined to teach their children integrity, strength, responsibility, courage, sharing, love of God, and pride in being an American. Remember, at the end of your life, you will never regret not having passed one more test, not winning one more verdict, or closing one more deal. You will regret time not spent with a spouse, a child, a parent, or a friend. No matter what our problems, we can always find people who are worse off than we are. Help them 
and forget self. And above all, seek God. There is absolutely no downside. Okay, I think you all can hear me now. Mark, thank you so much for that very gracious introduction. And it's such an honor for me to be here with you all today. I mean, I can think of a hundred things I would rather do during my lunchtime than spend time with me. So thanks for tuning in. And I do hope you'll have questions. I will warn you, if you don't ask me questions, I'm just gonna ramble on for an hour and that might get really, really boring. Uh, one of the things that I was thinking as I was watching that video, it will be two years this Friday when, from, when Mrs. Bush died. She died two years ago this coming Friday. And it's amazing to me how much her voice is still so important in our life and in our culture that some of the things she said two years ago, 30 years ago, still resonate. She truly was one of the best advice givers and one of the most prolific advice givers I think I ever knew, which is what inspired me to write the book, Pearls of Wisdom. Um, so I'm going to read just a couple of things for, for, from the book for you today. Some things I specifically, a couple of them selected for you as students. But the first one is, is she used to tell this to students all the time because she knew she was bossy. She admitted that she was bossy in the prologue of this book, the 43rd President of the United States, her oldest son, George W., I think his very first line of the prologue is, some might say that mother was bossy. Uh, yeah, she was. She gave us a lot of advice. And here was her excuse for being so bossy. I always love this. She said, now I can't give you any advice on how to be a good teacher or a writer or a scientist or an actor or a dancer. I especially can't give you advice on dancing, but neither she nor President Bush were very good dancers. They were pretty terrible, actually. But at this point in my life, I can share with you some ideas on how to survive the inevitable ups and downs. After all, in 80 years of living, I have survived six children, 17 grandchildren, six wars, a book by Kitty Kelly, two presidents, two governors, big election day wins and big election day losses, and 61 years of marriage to a husband who keeps jumping out of perfectly good airplanes. So it's just possible that along the way, I've learned a thing or two. Of course, by the time she died, she and President Bush had been married for 73 years, and she was 92 years old. So when she wrote that, she still had 12 amazing years ahead of her or of life and and life with her beloved husband, George Herbert Walker Bush. So when I was thinking about what I should share with you today from Pearls of Wisdom, I thought it might make a lot of sense to do something from one of her commencement speeches since all of you are students and some of you will be graduating with your master's degree this year. Congratulations. I loved her working with her in her commencement speeches because if nothing else, she was the most practical person. The advice she gave was, was just practical about how to live a happy and a useful life. So I'm going to read you just a couple of excerpts from one of her commencement speeches from 2002. And I think this is good advice for all of you. Learn not to take life too seriously or things too personally. Learn to laugh with others, not at them, but with them, and learn to laugh at yourself. Let me give you a little example. Last spring, after I gave a graduation speech at Texas A&M University, now you know why I chose this one, I received a letter from a woman in the audience. She thought I would be amused to learn that when she got home with her granddaughter, the little girl excitedly told her mother, that she had just heard the mother of the President of the United States. Imagine, the child said, I just saw, <coughs> oh, excuse me, I do not have COVID. I'm fairly certain, allergies. 
Anyway, the child said to her mother, I just saw the mother of the President of the United States speak. Imagine, the child said, I saw George Washington's mother. <laughs> Mrs. Bush always loved that. And she even admitted that she started to kind of sort of look like George Washington. So a sense of humor will help get you through life. It's also important that you believe in something larger than yourself. Get involved in your community. Try to help those who are less fortunate. One of the smartest people I know, that would be my husband, once said, any definition of a, success, of a successful life must include service to others. He has spent his life proving that to be true. Getting good grades and having a successful career are important, but so are being a good friend and a good and generous neighbor. I think, of course, this is something that the students at the George Bush School know only too well. I think it's one of the reasons why you came to the George Bush School, because you do believe in public service and community service. I think you're reminded of that every single day when you walk into that school. And here's the last part of the commencement speech I'm going to read to you. I always love this. Whatever you do, don't forget to dream. Many of you will change your mind a hundred times about what you want to be when you grow up, and that's the way it should be. Just don't ever say, I can't do that. What if Michael Jordan had said that when he was cut from his high school basketball team? Or if Louisa May Alcott, author of Little Women, had said that when her family told her she would never ever make a living by writing. Or if Walt Disney had said that when he was fired by a newspaper editor for, ready for this? Lack of ideas. You're just not very creative. All three of these people said, yes, I can. And then they did. Now go out and make us all proud and make something of yourself. Again, that was from, it's not me saying that, Barbara Bush said that. And that's what she would say to you if she were here. She would say, go out and make something of yourself and, and make us proud. So I'm asked a lot these days by different people in different groups. I just did a little blog for an organization here in Houston. People are just curious what I think the Bushes would be saying about what we're going through right now, what they would be saying about COVID-19 and about quarantine. I do know that President Bush in particular would be going crazy. He was the most social person I knew and being locked up in his house would drive him crazy. My guess if he were here, he would be, he would probably be on the Zoom call right now, zooming in with all of us. But I know they would want everyone to do this with good humor and not to wallow and how complicated this is. If nothing else, the Bushes were not wallowers. I found this from a speech Mrs. Bush gave after 9-11, and it really struck me how the advice she gave the country after 9-11 really resonates today. It's, it's just, I read that, I've read this now probably five times, and every time I read it, I think, oh boy, I need this good advice. So she was talking to a group of women shortly after 9-11. This is where I got the title of the book, by the way. She said to this group of women, what I'd really like to do today is to share some of the things I've learned in life. You could call them pearls of wisdom. Number one, there are 10 pearls. I'm only gonna read you three, don't panic. Number one, there's always something to be thankful for if you take the time to look for it. Unfortunately, it seems to me that especially in these uncertain times, people are always looking for the bad and never the good. But that's when it becomes even more important to look for the good. Just the other day, I heard someone complaining how much everything costs and they couldn't afford a thing. Their friend answered, living on earth is expensive, but it does include a free trip around the sun every single year. There are a few situations, no matter how sad or tragic, where most of us can't find something to be grateful for for friends and family, for our country, for our faith. It's such a waste of energy to dwell on the bad and not rejoice in the good. I mean, she said this in 2001, how 
much do we need to hear that today, that it's important to dwell on the good and not on the bad. There's so much more that's good than bad. Um, this was number five. This is a wonderful time for each of us to remind ourselves what's really important in life and what's not. One of many notes I received after September 11th came from a good friend who was away from home that day. When he got home, he was struck how trivial the headlines had been and the previous day's paper still waiting for him on his kitchen counter. When I looked over all the things that were so important on Monday and reflected how this act of terror changed our world in just a few seconds, now all I want to do is hug my wife and children and grandchildren and count my blessings. And this is advice number seven. And boy, can I use this advice right now? I have a feeling everybody at home can use this advice. Learn not to waste time. That doesn't mean you have to work hard and play hard every single minute. Enjoying a good book, taking a nap on the back porch, watching it rain. This, this is all time well spent. Staying angry at a friend, worrying about things you can't change, watching reruns on television. Those are precious moments lost. I learned very early on working for Barbara Bush, you don't ever really pick an argument with her, but I would tell her that watching reruns on television, that doesn't count right now because let's face it, we all have watched more episodes of Friends and The Office and I now know who the murderer is in Law and Order before the credits are over, the opening credits. But again, what wonderful advice to say, staying angry at a friend, but especially worrying about things you can't change. What, what a huge waste of time. So those were the three things I wanted to read to you. Mark, I'm ready to hear what's on the students' minds. I have one more thing I will read um, in a little bit if we run out of questions. But right now, I would just like to hear what, what all of you, you would like to know from me about the bushes. Well, thank you, Jean. And we do have some questions. Let me, the uh, first one has to do with Mrs. Bush's sense of humor. And uh, Holly Casperbauer wrote in and referenced a story in the book about Mary Kate Carey needing a swimsuit. But she wanted to know if there's uh, any other story that you have that might not be in the book about Mrs. Mrs. Bush that, that, that talks about her sense of humor. Uh, she had a wonderful sense of humor. Both of the Bushes did. And uh, she, uh, she was, a, you know, what, I, funny, what really comes to mind more than anything, what a good sport she was. I, her husband was a huge practical joker. And if you remember, Mary Kay Carey was wearing Mrs. Bush's swimsuit because President Bush insisted that it would be okay for Mary Kate to borrow Mrs. Bush's swimsuit, which embarrassed her just a little bit. I don't know what is moving me to tell you the story, but uh, I, <laughs> we all should need to learn to be a good sport. So Pre President and Mrs. Bush were out of town. We were in Kennebunkport and they come home and Mrs. Bush discovers that some of her grandsons had been on her computer while they were traveling. And they had very stupidly been on a porn website. I'm not going to name names. While they, on their grandmother's computer and had printed out a couple of photos and left them on the printer. Uh, just so you know, they were like 12, 13 years old. They were young. So, of course, all hell broke out, and Mrs. Bush went on this uh, mission to discover who the guilty people were, and it was hysterical. The staff was dying laughing over this, but obviously she was a little upset. Well, President Bush's reaction to this was to write his wife a fake letter. It is possible he had help from the staff. We created fake uh, stationery, and the letter said something like this, Dear B. Bush, it has come to our attention that you have been trafficking in pornography on your computer, which is violation of federal code, you know, what some fake number, 
you are now, you need to appear in federal court in Portland, Maine on this date to defend yourself against these charges and you could be facing jail time. He put this letter in the mail to his wife. Some staff person literally drove to Portland to mail the letter from Portland and not Kennebunkport. And she, he made sure that she opened the letter in his presence. And of course, she just couldn't believe it. And she said, oh my God, I'm going to be charged with pornography. And um, <laughs> it, and she, so finally she looked at her husband who was doing everything he could not to laugh. And then she caught on that she had been duped by him. But their whole marriage, their whole life was full of very fun things like that. They both just had terrific senses of humor. And I wish I could think of a better example, a more specific example of her sense of humor. But she just made us laugh all the time. She was just funny. Thanks, Jean. By the way, for any of you who joined late, if you have a question to ask Jean, please just send me a chat privately. Uh, this is Mark Welsh. And, uh, and I'll be glad to get it to Jean. Uh, and the list is not too extensive right now, so there's room for your question. Um, Jean, question from Chuck Herman. Could you say a little bit more about Mrs. Bush's selection of literacy, uh, of reading and literacy as her cause? Uh, since in the book you mentioned that when she made the choice back in 1978, she knew little to nothing about literacy as a program. She... Uh knew that as, as hopefully, the, she was hoping then to be the next First Lady of the United States. And she was a huge fan of Lady Bird Johnson, always was, they were good friends. And she always loved what Lady Bird said about being First Lady, that you have a bully pulpit that you must not waste. When you're First Lady, you have this opportunity to support a cause that you truly believe in. So she wanted to be ready to take advantage of that bully pulpit because one of the things that Lady Bird talked about is, you know, again, don't waste this opportunity. It would be foolish to do so. So she tells the story that she was running in Memorial Park, thinking about all the things in life that bothered her. And they included everything from drug addiction, unemployment, poverty, teenage pregnancy, and it occurred to her, and I, I'm, I can't really explain how or why, but it occurred to her that what would solve all of these problems would be an education. If everybody had the same opportunity to have a good education, and she knew, knew that uh, her son, Neil, was dyslexic. I think Neil actually talked about that maybe a little bit last week. She had dealt with Neil's dyslexic issues uh, his entire life. So through that, she had learned really how important it is to be able to read and write in order to get a good education. So the light bulb came on with her that if more people could read and write, more people could get an education. And the more people had a good education, the fewer problems we would have with unemployment, drug addiction, poverty, imprisonment, et cetera. So that is how she decided to make literacy her cause. And the funny story that she tells that I think I, I'm pretty sure I put in the book, she told the campaign, um, the very fledging George Bush for president campaign in 1978, that she had chosen literacy as her topic. What she did not tell them is she really didn't know anything about it. You know, she, it was just what she wanted to do, it's she, you know, she had a plan to immerse herself in it, learn more about it, but she really didn't know anything then. She had no idea how to make America more literate. Well, her first campaign stop after that was in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, at a Catholic college, and she was going to do a round table with some of the faculty, and they all sat down, and the the president of the college introduced her and said. Mrs. Bush, we're so thrilled to hear that literacy is going to be your, your cause if you become First Lady. It's such an important one. Everyone in education definitely knows how important it is for us to become a more literate nation. And we cannot wait to hear what your ideas are and what your plan is. Well, she didn't have a plan. She had just totally made this up. 
But typical of Barbara Bush, she, I, she writes that she panicked for about five seconds. And then she looked at everybody and she said, well, you know, instead of you listening to me talk about my plan, what I would love to hear is what you think about literacy. And if you were in my shoes, how would you make America more literate? So she went around the room and she admits that the teachers were all thrilled to be able to voice their opinions. And she left there without them knowing that she didn't know anything, but she learned a lot that day. So that's how literacy became her cause. And it was her cause, honestly, until she died. Um, we were in the middle of a huge search for a new president and CEO as she, like two years ago at this time. And the last time I saw her, the, which was the night before she died, she asked me how the search was going for a new president and CEO of her literacy foundation. And uh, she was passionate about it. And the good news is the Barbara Bush Foundation for Family Literacy, we feel we're on fire right now because we really want to fulfill her mission. And it's one of the reasons why all the authors proceeds from this book will go to her literacy foundation. Uh, <clears throat> several people have asked me about that. And I said, you know, first of all, she is officially, she is the author of the book and you don't need money in heaven, but it certainly was the right thing to do. So when you buy this book, not only will you have this wonderful book on your bookshelf, but you'll also be donat donating money to a great cause. So Jean, what's the best way to buy the book? And I'm sure they have in the library, uh, over them on Amazon. What's the best way? Oh, you can, it's on um, Barnes and Noble's website. It's certainly on Amazon's website. Amazon has actually run out a couple of times because a couple of dear and great friends have done some bulk buying. I think all of you uh, may know who Ron Kaufman is. Katie Kaufman's, maybe he's known to you all as Katie Kaufman's father, who was Bush School alumni of the year a year ago. Ron just bought 80 books, is what he's giving away as gifts to everybody. But probably Amazon, they're the cheapest. I will whisper in your ear, they're the cheapest on Amazon, so I would go to Amazon. Okay, thank you. Um, a, a really a great question here. Um, can, you, can you tell us which was tougher for Mrs. Bush? Hearing criticism of 43 or hearing criticism of 41? It would be hearing criticism of 43 uh, for a little different reason than you might think. Uh, I think it was hard enough to hear criticism of her husband. But what was more complicated about when George W. was president during those eight years, Mrs. Bush, and I do think it's different when it's your son, but her problem was she was married to a man who just could not tolerate criticism of his son. So Mrs. Bush not only had to deal with her own angst about hearing her son criticize, she had to hear her husband's angst. And President Bush would tell you that people criticizing him never really bothered him. I don't think he paid attention. I don't think he watched the news. He read newspapers. He was certainly well informed, but he said when he got criticized, when he was president, just rolled right off his back. But it just killed him when people criticized George W. And I would beg him not to read the newspapers, not to watch certain TV shows, but he couldn't help himself. So Mrs. Bush had to hold his hand through all of that. And I would tell you that the president of the United States, George W., would constantly call his dad and say, Dad, I'm fine. I'm fine. Please turn TV off. I'm just fine. He was, he was exactly where his father had been when he was president. He didn't pay attention. He really did not take it personally. So it was, it was harder for her while her son was in the White House. Okay, thank you. Um, how did you come to be the Deputy Press Secretary to the First Lady of the United States back in 1989? Um, well, it's sort of a, it was sort of a roundabout way. It wasn't, it might be not how you think. 
I was, my background is journalism. I was a newspaper reporter for 10 years and I was a newspaper reporter for USA Today during the 1988 campaign and I was a member of their election team. I was the election team's feature writer. It was a great job. My first assignment, I think there were 15 presidential candidates that year on both sides, seven or eight Republicans, seven or eight Democrats. And USA Today did a series called The Candidates at Home. I visited all 15 candidates in their houses and interviewed them with their spouses and sometimes their dogs and sometimes their kids. It was really fun. It was a great assignment but so I got to know all the candidates and and their spouses so at some point toward the end of the summer of 1988 USA Today convinced Barbara Bush and Kitty Dukakis who was the wife of the Democratic candidate Governor Michael Dukakis of Massachusetts they wrote a column for us every Monday morning it was a Monday's paper called I think behind the scenes on the campaign trail. It was supposed to be sort of, you know, a little lighter. It wasn't supposed to be policy. It was supposed to be just good stories and stuff that had happened on the campaign trail. And I was their editor. I was asked, my, the editor, the, the boss of the election team asked me to do this project. And quite frankly, I wasn't very happy. I didn't want to do it. I thought it would pigeonhole me a little bit. And I turned out loving the assignment partially because I really love both of them, got to know them both really well. I would travel with them one day a week toward the end of the week and start to go over their week and try to help them. They were supposed to write the column, trying to help steer them toward what we were looking for. And then every Sunday night, they would turn their columns into me. And they, I needed 15 inches. I still remember this. Their columns were exactly 15 inches they would always turn in 30 to 45 inches. So my job was to cut it in half. And then the deal we had with them, because it was their name on the column, is I would call them back and read them the edited form. Well, in the Dukakis campaign, I called Kitty Dukakis's press secretary, a guy named Paul Costello, and he's the one who would sign off on it. Barbara Bush wanted to do this directly. She didn't want anyone in the middle. So every Sunday night, I would call Barbara Bush and go over her column with her, and we became friends. That's how I got to know her so well. But here's how weird it is that I became her deputy press secretary. After the election and President Bush had won, USA Today wanted to use my relationship with Barbara Bush. They wanted me to pitch to the Bushes that I would hang out with the Bush family inauguration week. They now call that being embedded. I don't think we were using that term yet then, but they wanted to embed me with the Bush family. And I was dispatched to pitch this idea to Barbara Bush's chief of staff. And I had lunch with her one day to pitch this idea, which I was fairly certain they would say no to. And she had just had a meeting with Marlon Fitzwater, who was President Bush's press secretary, and he had chewed her out. He had chewed her out because she had hired two of the first lady's press office people, her press secretary, a woman named Anna Perez, and one of the deputy press secretaries. And neither one of them were journalists. They both came from the PR side of the business. And Marlon told Susan, you have got to hire a real journalist. You've got to hire someone who's worked for a newspaper or has worked for a newscast, someone who really understands journalism and reporters. And Susan was just telling me all this. She was frustrated and she was angry. And she said, I already knew who I was gonna hire and I don't have any ideas. I have no idea who's out there who'd be interested in this job. And I still remember the minute that light bulb came on. We're sitting in the restaurant at the Hay Adams and she's sort of in the middle of a sentence and she looked at me and she said, oh my god you're a reporter I'm like yeah i am you would be right on that she said oh my god you how about you and she offered me the job on the spot and it took me two weeks to say yes i wasn't sure i wanted to do it it was going to be a huge pay cut um 
It was, uh, I was very happy. I loved my job at USA Today. I was gonna be one of their White House reporters. And it was my dad, a farmer from Missouri who never graduated from high school, who said to me, and I, by the way, I grew up a Democrat, which was also sort of interesting. And by that time, I was very apolitical. I really was a reporter who had no politics. Anyway, my dad said, what the hell is wrong with you? You're, so you have an opportunity to work for the First Lady of the United States. He says, what are you doing? And I said, you're right. I said, yes, and I never looked back. I never thought I would work for them for the next 30 years, but it was a great decision. Thank you, Jean. Thanks for telling us that. Um, shift gears a little bit. What do you think the President and Mrs. Bush would say about the importance of the arts? in this uh, very weird time that we're in now. The importance of what? Of the arts, A-R-T-S. Okay, that sounds like a loaded question. I think the importance of the arts, I'd be curious to know why you're asking me that, Mark Welsh. I, no one loved the arts more than uh, President and Mrs. Bush. They were huge um, supporters, particularly of theater. President Bush was a big song and dance man, but they loved uh, the theater, they loved musicals, they loved plays, and they loved arts. And I think it, it would make them very sad that uh, all our theaters are dark right now. President Bush thought that music made a huge difference in our lives. And I think they would feel strongly that we need to support the arts when we come back out of this to make sure that our art community continues to thrive. Okay, thank you, Jean. Um, another great question. This is uh, referring to Mrs. Bush's use of that bully pulpit you mentioned before. Uh, and this particular uh, writer loves about Mrs. Bush that she spoke up for those who are being discriminated against. And she highlights the example in the book of cradling the HIV baby at a time when everyone was terrified of AIDS. Uh, are there other examples of Mrs. Bush using the bully pulpit to help Americans rethink about a particular issue other than literacy, which you've already discussed, that aren't um, in the book? Yes, the, the AIDS is a great example, is probably the best example in the book. Mrs. Bush was a huge advocate uh, for people with AIDS and that the picture of her holding that, cuddling the baby with AIDS, we did not use the term viral yet because uh, we had not, the internet was still in its fledging stages, but she made a huge difference in this world uh, when it came to people with AIDS and showing that they were not to be feared, they were not to be discriminated against. I will give you a uh, funny little example of how she used her bully pulpit. She was very spontaneous and she woke up one day and read in the Washington Post, that most of the malls in Washington, D.C. had decided to kick the Salvation Army bell ringers out of the malls at Christmas time, that Christmas, because they thought that the bell ringers were annoying, they were pests, they made noise, the shopper, they made the shoppers feel uncomfortable, so they were kicking them out. So Barbara Bush was just furious about this. She just couldn't believe it. So she called her press office and I was the lucky one to take the call. And she said, call the press, find a mall in DC that the bell ringers are still there and call the press and meet me there in an hour. Well, it was a mall called Mazda Gallery that was up Wisconsin Avenue. It was in the article that they were still allowing bell ringers. So we called the press and of course they wanted to know, well, what's going on? And I said, I don't know. But the First Lady of the United States would like for a pool, a press pool to meet her at the Mazda Gallery. And I said, I'm going to go there and I will have to call you with the exact location. So I went to the gallery. I found the Salvation Army bell ringer. I called the press. And sure enough, here comes the First Lady of the United States sweeps in. And the poor bell ringer was sort of in a state of shock. I told him what was going on. My favorite part of this story is she put $11 in the red bucket. I wanted to say to her, you didn't have a 20? I mean, really? I, 
I think she put everything, I think she put everything in the bucket that was in her billfold, but it was just, it was a 10 and a one. Don't ask me how I remember that. But that was it. She, uh, the, the malls changed their mind. They all reopened their doors to the bell ringers and it was never, never became an issue ever again. And when she died, actually the Houston Area Salvation Army put out a statement saying that uh, she probably saved the bell ringing campaign nationwide that year because their fear is that a lot of other malls would have followed the lead of the Washington DC malls. Um, but to the bigger question, I've always loved that story, mainly because she put $11 in the pot. Um, to the bigger, bigger question about discrimination, one of the things that I had been using in my book tour, which of course got canceled by the coronavirus, there was something going on in 1991 that really was bothering um, Mrs. Bush, because her commencement speeches that year she talked a lot about the need for tolerance in this country. And I actually made an effort to try to find out what had gone on. Um, I did, there, were, there had been some really serious race riots in Los Angeles that had been brought about by a black man being beat up by some police officers. And it, there, it also was beginning the 1992 campaign. So maybe that was part of it. But there was something going on in the country that she saw that she didn't like. And I'm just going to read you a couple of the things um, that she said. This showed up in all of her speeches that year. She said, I, this particular speech was to the Pueblo Community College commencement, May 1991. I would like for you to think about your relationships in a broader sense, the way you feel about and interact with people beyond your loved ones, beyond the people you know here in Pueblo and the friends you've made so far in life. I'm talking about the great need for better tolerance in our society. To be different, that is what life in America is about after all. It can be difficult to be different in our society because it's way too easy to be intolerant. Tolerance is much more than just respecting people of a different race. It is a constant stream of little acts in our life, big and small choices we face every day and the way we think about and talk about and deal with other human beings. It's about respecting people who have a physical or mental handicap, people who grew up different from the way you did, people who speak a different language or practice a different religion, people who are fatter or thinner or older or younger. This was to the University of Michigan. We should all, all be alarmed at the rise of intolerance in our land and by the growing tendency to use intimidation rather than reason to settle disputes. And before I read you this next part, let me just remind you, she wrote this in 1991. Political extremists roamed the land, setting citizens against one another on the basis of their class or race. Such bullying is outrageous and not worthy of a great nation. Let us fight back against the boring politics of division and derision. And then she went on to tell people, the students, we, we must build a society in which people do not have to surrender their identities. And she asked them to take the lead. God, I love that woman. We need her voice in our life today. And, uh, but I love that 30 years ago, she was talking about the politics of derision and division. And this is not a political statement. She would not approve of what's going on right now. And I would love to hear what she would have to say, but she did not like screaming and yelling and she really hated all of that. And she would be giving us the what for right now if she were here. Gene, along, along those lines, there's something else that happened almost 30 years ago. Um, and, and this is actually relayed by one of our current students, um, a great lady named Leslie Cole. And Leslie, excuse me for calling you out, but Leslie sent me a comment, really, not, not a question. Um, and let me just read this to you. Leslie, by the way, Jean is a, uh, she has a PhD. She is a university professor. And now she's a student at the Bush School. 
But here's what Leslie wrote. I just want to thank Mrs. Bush. I would not have been a student here if in 1994 I had not met Mrs. Bush. When I met her, we discussed my doctoral program, and she gave me a hard time about it. She looked at me and said, what are you going to do to help people? Two decades later, I'm answering her question. I just think oh, wow. that's a great anecdote of Mrs. Bush always focusing on this idea of how are we going to help people. Um, it, you know, and we have the great thing about the Bush schools, we've got people from professors to staff members to, um, to people who come in and contract to help us serve food to people who all are about helping people. It's fantastic. Um, we've got one, one last question here, Gene, and then I think it's a fairly quick one. And then I'm going to turn it over to you to um, tell one last story that you'd like to do that. Um, and, and, and also, if you wouldn't mind to give us an example or two of the Bushes interacting with Bush School students from the early years, because I know you remember that. But the question is, did Mrs. Bush like Maureen Dowd, or did she just tolerate her? And you might want to mention who Maureen Dowd is for everybody on the discussion. Uh, Mrs. Bush did not like Maureen Dowd, but President Bush did. The two of them had a correspondence relationship and he would send her little gifts. They would send each other gifts. And he would send her little, he would send her gifts and say, um, I don't know why I'm sending you this gift. You make me furious. You're, I, I don't like anything that you write, but I like you. I think you're very bright. Um, President Bush, he, one of the great traits of both of them, Mrs. Bush, I think just tolerated her. <clears throat> excuse me, just sort of tolerated Maureen. Um, she came to Houston and saw them, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. I think everything was 10 years ago. And we all went and had lunch. And uh, President Bush and Mrs. Bush, one of their great uh, things about them that I admire is they, they knew how to agree to disagree they their friends they had friends from that were democrats republicans independents they had friends from all walk of life um they you know before president bush decided to his his pallbearers and walk in at the cathedral in dc were all the captains of the uss george hw bush and his pallbearers in houston were his grandsons but at, there was a time 10 years ago where his pallbearers included everyone from Fuzzy the Pizza Man to James Baker. You know, it ran the whole gamut and they were both like that. They, they had a fondness for people that people would start to scratch their heads. And of course, there was no greater example than Bill Clinton or as Mrs. Bush called them, the odd couple. But uh, yeah, Maureen particularly drove Mrs. Bush crazy while George W. was president. Because as if you read Maureen Dowd, you know that she's not 43's biggest fan. But she was invited to President Bush's funeral. And she actually emailed me and asked me if, if 43rd president had looked at the funeral list and knew that she was invited. I probably shouldn't tell you this. And I emailed her back <coughs> and I said, yes, Maureen, the 43rd president actually did asked to see the invitation list to his father's funeral. So yes, he knew you were on it. And there were several people that he suggested deleting, and no, I'm not gonna tell you who they are, but you weren't one of them. I'm not gonna tell you all either. But anyway, uh, you know, it's just a great example in this family of, yeah, you may not agree with what they think or say or whatever, but it doesn't mean you're a bad person necessarily. Thanks, Gene. Okay, how about giving us one example of the Bush's interaction with Bush School students in the early years uh, that maybe you were here to see? And then I know you have one final story you'd like to tell us, and I'll leave you the rest of the time to close things okay. out. We have 10 minutes left. Um, I think, I hope all the students there know that President Bush, he really hated the L word, legacy. He hated that word, um, but he knew in his heart that of course he would as a president have a legacy. He considered the Bush School as his most important legacy. And when he left, uh, just the fact that it exists. And he loved interacting with the students. He would sit in on classes. He would teach a class once a year and talk about different topics, foreign policy, or 
he would just show up and sit in the back of classrooms, which I think teachers, the professors sometimes found a little discombobulating. He loved to walk around outside there and just run into the students and talk to them and meeting with you all just made his day. And he really felt strongly that the young people of this country were our future, which of course they are, but he wanted a school that taught the importance and the value of public service. And he was thrilled with the Bush School and the people who taught there and the students who went there. He, his, he felt his dream had been fulfilled. And I have a lot of people on this call to thank for that, that you fulfilled one of his biggest dreams. Everything he'd hoped for the Bush School definitely came true before he died. So I want to tell you a story about President Bush, even though our main topic today was Mrs. Bush. I am writing a second book about, I'm writing a book about President Bush and his post-presidency, and the Bush School will definitely be, be part of that story. But one of the things you all need to know about the namesake of the school that you chose to attend or the school that you chose to be a professor is he truly was one of the most pragmatic people I ever met. And he also was such a problem solver. President Bush had a mind that worked unlike anyone else's I ever knew. And one of my, I could tell you a hundred stories, you're gonna have to read the book, but one of my favorite stories about George Bush <clears throat> involves a man named Prince Bandar. Prince Bandar was the ambassador from Saudi Arabia to the United States, I think for almost 25, maybe even 30 years. He was the ambassador, he was the nephew of the king, and he was very close to President Bush. He was ambassador during both George Bush's presidencies. So he was the ambassador during Desert Storm. And President Bush, he was almost like a second son. The, the Bush boys used to call Prince Bandar their Arab brother. Well, long after he was no longer ambassador, I think this was 2004 maybe, um, he was back in Saudi Arabia and he was head of the Saudi intelligence service. And I got a call one night from a woman who used to work for um, Secretary Baker. And she wanted to know if I'd heard the rumor that the Syrians had assassinated Prince Bandar. And I was watching, I do remember I was watching the Summer Olympics and I'm thinking, oh my God. Uh, I said, no, I have not heard a rumor of this. And she says, well, when is the last time President Bush talked to Prince Bandar? And it had been a while. And Margaret said, I would love for you to check your sources and find out if they know where Prince Bandar is and if it's possible the Syrians have assassinated him. And I knew what she was asking me to do. She wanted me to call the CIA because the CIA always had an officer dedicated to President Bush to answer his questions and be available to him. He liked to be able to pick up the phone and call the agency and find out random things, random secret things. So I called his person and she said, we are well aware of these rumors. Unfortunately, we think it's true. Bandar has not been seen in a very long time. And we think the Syrians have assassinated him. But we have boots on the ground. I can't confirm it. We're doing our best to confirm because we think it's about ready to go public. So I didn't tell him, I called Secretary Baker, I called Brent Scowcroft, his national security advisor, and they were checking their sources and um, they also feared it maybe was true because the Syrians thought that Bandar had been involved in a plot to assassinate the president of Syria and they thought this was retribution. So Margaret Tutwiler called me and she said, the French press, has just announced it. It's, it's gonna hit CNN any minute. The French press is now announcing that Bandar is dead, has been assassinated by the Syrians. So President Bush came down to the office. He still wasn't in a wheelchair, but he was very close to a wheelchair and he came down, his Parkinson's disease had not been diagnosed yet, but he came down to the office in a golf cart 
and he asked me to come sit on the golf cart with him so we could go over the mail and talk about whatever we need to talk about. So I gave him the news. I said, sir, I need to tell you something. And I knew this would be hard for him to take and because he truly loved Bandar. And he said, well, have you called Bandar? Well, the answer to that would be no. I didn't, you know, first of all, I could not pick up the phone and call Prince Bandar. And it never occurred to me to call someone who we thought had been assassinated to ask, to have them confirm the rumor. And I said, no, sir, I've, I've not called Prince Bandar. And he says, well, let's get Bandar on the phone. So we're sitting outside, we're in Kennebunkport, and I holler through an open window at his aide, Jim Appleby, a graduate of the Bush School, by the way. I said to Jim Appleby, could you get Prince Bandar on the phone? And Jim looked, leaned out the window and he said, have you told him? Have you told him? I said, yes, I have told him he would like to get Bandar on the phone. And this is truly the day that I knew I had to write a book because Bandar, uh, Jim leans back out the window and he said, Prince Bandar is on line one. So President Bush picks up the phone and I'm sitting next to him and he's like, yeah, Bandar, yeah, George Bush. Hey man, dead or alive? Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh -huh. And then he looks at me and he says, he's alive. And I'm like, yeah, I sort of caught on to that. And he says, everybody here thinks you're dead. And Bandar proceeds to tell him the Syrians are trying to kill me. I'm in hiding. Don't worry about me. They're never going to find me. It's all going to be fine. And President Bush is, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then he gets off the phone. And he says, so Gene, this is a good lesson for you. If there's ever, you know, confusion about whether someone's alive or dead, you pick up the phone and you call them. And if they answer the phone, it proves that they're alive. And then he just races off on his golf cart. And of course I'm thinking, well, he has a point. <laughs> he definitely proved that he was alive. So I made the mistake of not calling the CIA right away. It was just the whole thing was just, so he called Secretary Baker, he called Brent, told them he's alive. About two hours later, the phone rings and I happened to answer it. And it's a CIA. And this poor woman says, Gene, we still cannot confirm for sure what has happened to Bandar. We think it's true. We do think Bandar has pro is dead and he has been assassinated by the Syrians. So I took a deep breath and I said, I have something to tell you. He's alive. And she says, well, how do you know that? I said, President Bush called him on his secret cell phone and he answered the phone. And there was this long pause and she said, God, we got to put that man back on payroll. <laughs> that was the day that I knew I would write a book, Mark. You know, the man just, you know, he knew how to solve problems. <laughs> anyway, thank you so much for having me. This was a lot of fun. Um, I appreciate you all spending your lunch hour with me. And if you have any more questions or whatever, you can always email them to Mark or Mary Hine and, or Frank Ashley. I'd be happy to answer him. <laughs> it's an honor to have you here, Gene. It's great to see you as always. Thanks for everything you do for so many people, but particularly thanks for everything you've done for the Bush School over the years and continue to do as a member of our advisory board and in so many other ways. It's great to see you. Great to see everybody. Bye. Thanks, Gene. Bye, Frank. Bye, Arnie. Bye, everybody. <laughs> <laughs>